everybody. How are you today? Good. Um, thank you for being here. My name is Jules Downham. If you don't know who I am, I'm, let me see if I can work this thing. Ah, there it is. Um, I'm the executive and artistic director of the Pop-Up Project, which I co-founded in 2016. We are a nonprofit dance and production company, and we have several of our dancers here. If you guys wave if you're a pop-up dancer. Yeah. Um, and we do a lot, actually, in town. There's about 22 dancers in our company, and we create immersive events in unusual spaces. We did an event here last fall. Um, these are where the, these pictures are from, and we're actually doing it again this year. Uh, I'll tell you about that later, because I want you to all come. We also have a, a youth program that serves over 400 children every single week with free dance classes. Um, we pop up all over town at, at other people's events and dance, and then we also produce film. So um, today, I'm so excited to talk to you about wonder and, and awe and reverie, because those are my favorite subjects, and I'm going to share some science I discovered behind it. And the reason I got so excited about this science is because when I read it, I was like, oh my gosh, that explains my experience. That's what was happening in my brain uh, when I had to chase this, this crazy path that I'm going to tell you a little bit about and share. And I don't know why we need science to validate our own experiences. <laughs> and make us feel justified in our choices, but I, I did, and I do, and so um, I'm hoping that hearing some of this science will uh, excite and empower you as well. Um, and so I do want to cite some of my sources. The Science of Awe is a book by Dacher Keltner. Ayla, my lovely daughter and assistant, is holding it up. I have them here, yes. Yes, she came to support Mama today, so sweet. Um, Two books by Daniel Cole, The Talent Co Code and The Little Book of Talent, both talk a lot about, <laughs> yes, about what's actually happening in our brains when we learn, which I find really, really inspiring. I also learned about that in grad school, but I don't know any of those sources anymore, so these are other great sources. And I am going to invite a little bit of movement that you can do in the space or in your chair. And I'm using a, an exercise that's pretty widespread among dance, but it comes from the book uh, Creative Movement by Anne Green Gilbert. So that's kind of where the science is coming from. So, but, but, but like I mentioned, the reason I'm excited about the science is because of how, it, uh, how I related to it from my personal story. So I want to tell you a little bit about myself, just a little. I'm from Whitwell, Tennessee. Some of you might know it. It is a beautiful, natural space. But what it has in natural beauty, it really lacks in um, cultural assets. And so um, the school I went to had no arts programming at all. Um, there's not, still to this day, there's not one single dance studio in the entire Sequatchie Valley. And so I didn't have access to the arts at all um, as, a, as a young child. And um, I didn't really think it was for, for me either, because the cultural context I grew up in, art wasn't important. It wasn't seen as valued. And there were two myths that I really adopted from this cultural context, which are not specific to Whitwell, but which were certainly there. And those are that creativity is genius, right, it's special, and that you're born with it or you're not, right? And the second myth was that wonder is childish. And so those, that, is the, that is kind of two myths that I had adopted, and I want to look at each of them a little more closely. So I did not receive the message that I was not creative because I was told that necessarily. I received that message because I had no access to any creative resources, no one I knew did, and I heard my parents say it about themselves. And to this day, my mom, who's so creative, will still say, oh, I'm just not creative. I'm just not that kind of person. And so I began to believe it about myself, too. So be careful what you say about yourself in front of your children. Um, the second, you know, wonder is childish. 
art is frivolous. When you grow up, you put away childish things, right? And you get along, get on with the business of your life, and you need to be really serious. And so that was my context. And so picture me. There I am. I was really cute when I was little. Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> but I, I showed this picture because she's cute. But um, picture 19-year-old Jules. She wasn't as cute. She had like the, remember those like, remember the parts? And the like highlights like right here, just like right here, and the Britney Spears jeans. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. The fly was this long, boot cut, you know, feeling yourself. There I was, ready to get along with the business of my life. And the, the way I understand, like when I look back on that, who I was in that moment, the best way I know how to describe myself is that I didn't really see the world in, in its full colors. I, um, I didn't have a lot of joy. I didn't have a lot of inspiration or motivation, right? I was just kind of going through the business of my life and trying to figure out what kind of serious job I was going to get, and I spent a lot of time like in front of the television, just zoned out. Um, so that's who I was. And then there was this thing that happened to me. Uh, a friend of mine signed me up for a belly dance class, of all things. And I was so angry. I'll use the word angry because my child is here. <laughs> but she paid for it, so I felt like I had to go. And I was like, oh my God. So I went. And when I tell you that I can vividly remember everything about that moment, I remember my hand on the door. I remember opening the door, and, and it literally opened a new world for me in that moment. I remember the color of the wall. I remember the scent. I smelled incense for the first time that day. And then I experienced my body, which I was very disconnected from and had disordered eating, learning dance technique. So by the way, I was 19 at that time. If you know anything about dance, I was ancient for dance. So I was also telling myself, like, there's no way. I'm old. How can I learn to do that? And I felt my body actually learning it and being able to learn if I was taught. And I was like, oh my god. And I was also doing it in a room of other adults who also had a beginner mentality and weren't being shamed for it, right? Like being invited to learn. And it was like an instant addiction. I had, it ignited in me this insatiable desire to know more. And um, learning about dance technique ignited belly dance technique led me to want to know more about other dance techniques. And learning about dance techniques led me to want to know about dance making. And learning about dance making led me to want to learn about dance productions. I wanted to learn about dance cultures around the world. I still am happiest when I'm in a dance class. And I still go to every single dance class I can. And I remember saying to my husband, I was married at that time. We got married, married, married very young. I know this is crazy. Like, I know I'm crazy, because I didn't have the science to justify it yet. <laughs> but I just, I have to do this. I don't know why, but I just really have to do this. Um, my family actually thought I was in a cult. <laughs> True story. <laughs> True story. And had an intervention because of the fervor and uh, almost uncontrollable desire to seek this experience for myself and to connect to it because it was giving me life. So, like I said, I lived with this anecdotally for many years. I understood the power of that moment, that literal moment for me and what it opened my life to, but I didn't know how to explain it. And so I'd be like, I don't know, it's crazy, whatever. Um, sure. But then I found the science. And I started to understand what was happening in my brain and my body and my heart. And I want to share that with you today. So I'm, I have notes so I don't go on a wild tangent and keep, like, hold y'all hostage all day. Um, oh, I do want to say one thing. The reason that that moment was so dramatic for me, and I think this is really exciting, is not because dance class itself is like, uh, this crazy thing, right? I wasn't in space. I wasn't at the bottom of the ocean exploring this thing nobody had ever seen. 
It was something that's actually very common and accessible. It was dramatic for me because I lacked awe and wonder. So, enter the science of awe. So what uh, Dacher Keltner says is that moments of being awestruck, so, and he defines awe as the experience of being in the presence of something vast and unknown. So I was like, dance, right? Leads us to experiencing wonder. And wonder ooh, is defined as the mental state of openness, questioning, curiosity, and embracing mysteries. So going back to one of those myths I mentioned earlier that um, wonder and play and curiosity are childish, his research actually shows that when we're in a state of wonder, um, our thought is more rigorous and energized, and it leads us to the actions of exploring, investigating, playing, and learning as adults. What he says about emotions, all emotions, is their mental and physiological states that are generative of action. So wonder leads to learning, right, if we follow it. So when I read that, I was like, oh my gosh, it brought back some information I had learned about learning in graduate school. So learning, is, learning in a state of wonder will, content, will allow us to continue to ignite curiosity, right? Because we're, we're satisfying it, we're bringing up more mysteries, and the more we follow that wonder, we follow that path, it will continue to ignite curiosity, and I think it leads us to our, ult our calling, ultimately, if we allow ourselves to follow it. But, so, let me go actually to this one. So, the thing about learning, what is happening in our brain? Scientists refer to this as brain plasticity. So when you're learning, oh, sorry, let me define brain plasticity first. Ah, can I go back? How do I go back? Uh-oh. I keep hitting it without realizing it, too. Okay. So I'll define it here. So um, brain plasticity is the biological, chemical, and physical capacity of the brain to reorganize its structure and function. Neuroplasticity occurs as a result of learning, experience, and memory formation. So when you're learning, you're actually, your brain is actually building something, building new pathways. It's a little construction project, right? And so the slide that I had, what is human, um, this is something that came up in grad school. When scientists are Scientists are very interested in classifying things, right? So they want to understand, like, why is this thing this thing? What differentiates it from this very closely related thing? And so they were trying to define what is a human. And at first they threw out, like, okay, is it tool use? I'm speaking of anthropologists in particular. Um, it's not tool use. Even crows use tools. I don't know if you guys knew that. Um, the second theory that they had is maybe it's language. That also is not unique to humans. But what they found is that the degree of our brain plasticity and the longevity of it is unique to humans. And so many animals have brain plasticity. They have the ability to learn. But humans have the ability to learn a lot of information at a very quick rate. And you maintain the same ability as an adult that you have as a child. So your brain's ability to organize new information remains the same well into adulthood. It does start to slow down as we get older, but that's very unique to humans. So our closest relatives, our primates, once they leave juvenile stage, their brains start to harden and they, their ability to learn new information slows down remarkably. So why, why I find this information about learning so exciting is because I really think it kind of expands Keltner's theory and it supports what he has to say about the importance of wonder and awe. Our brains are structured, actually designed and structured to support the actions we take in a state of wonder and curiosity, which is learning. And I think that's why learning, continual learning and wonder are so important to our mental well-being. Okay, so back to Keltner's research. He talks about 
so I talked about the way that awe leads to wonder, right? Moments of awe. So in his research, he did a vast study cross-culturally around the world with thousands of participants to understand what are the most common things that cause awe in human beings. And what's really exciting is that they're everyday things. They're things that we can encounter every single day. We don't have to go to space. We don't have to like travel to the eight wonders of the world. They're things that are all around us. And if we are attuned to them, they will give us wonder. And so I want us to do a little movement together to explore and share our own awe and wonder. You can do this walking around the space, or you can do it in your seat if you're more comfortable with that. If you would like to move around the space, I invite you to get up. I do want to ask that you not come here because of the wires. I don't want you to run into the wires. But if you'd like to do this movement activity out of your chair, go ahead and get up and just start walking around the space. And let's, let's not talk while we do this so we can start to focus. And as you walk, just start to pay attention to what you're feeling. Your feet on the floor, maybe take in a new part of the space that you haven't seen yet. Maybe smile at your friends as you pass them. And as you go about your walk, I just invite you to think about a moment where you felt awestruck. It can be something that happened 20 years ago or last week. And in a moment, I'm going to count backwards from eight to one. And when I get to one, I just want you to find a partner. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, find a partner, introduce yourself if you don't know each other. If you need to be in a group of three, you can. Ayla, you can be my partner. Does everybody have a partner? Don't be shy if you need to make a group of three, go for it. I see. Okay, so. Here's what you're going to do in your partnership. First, you're going to share what your moment of awe was with your partner. So go ahead and do that, and then I'll tell you number two, what you're going to do.
take about one more minute to finish telling your stories and then we're gonna move to number two, okay? One more minute. Yeah, it's a good it's turnout. Good. They have a good following. Good for you. Yeah. We've, we've got 20 vacant houses. Okay. So if they want to stay here, just remind them. That they can, they, yeah. They don't have to go away. They can stay. <laughs> they can but, stay forever. Yeah. Yeah. The whole point is to stay. Yeah. 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 Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring our attention back now. How cool. You can stay where you are. I hope I didn't cut anybody's awe story too, too short, but I do want to move you to number two. So I want you to think of a shape that represents your moment of awe. Don't overthink it. It can be anything. And then I want you to show your partner your shape. And I'm going to tell you number three already. Can you come, with, come, come here, Ayla? My lovely assistant. So, if my shape is this, you make a shape. If her shape is that, then we're going to connect them. So we're going to go, right? Just connect the dots, and you're making a little dance together. Yes? <laughs> Create your own shape, teach it to your partner, connect the dots. By the way, your connection could be like, you could do anything you want. <laughs> but begin and end with the shape, okay? Go. You've got one more minute to finish your dance. One more minute. you are done. Cool, cool. It looks like most of you are done. Yes? Are we done? Do I have any groups uh, who would like to show their dance? Be brave. Okay, come on up. We're going to have two groups show their dance and then I would love you to tell a little bit about your awe. It, however you want to do it. Great. Okay. 
Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. I love it. Would any other group like to show their dance? Yeah. Okay, come on down. Thank you. Nope. Come to the light. two dancers in the house. <laughs> Anybody else want to do it? Come on down. Yes, come on down. Perfect. They're working, they're working on their formations, getting warm. Nice, yes. Let's give a round of our applause to all of our dancers this morning. You can go ahead and find your way back to your seats if you would like. I'm just going to go back to um, Keltner's list one more time really quickly, and I think that most of them are self-explanatory except for the first two. The first one is moral beauty. It was the most commonly reported thing to cause awe in human beings, and that is defined as the kindness, generosity, talent, passion, sacrifice of another human being. And so he says that when we see someone else and we're awed by their moral beauty, it gives us goosebumps and, it, and we cry, right? And it leads us to actually want to be better humans too. The second one is collective effervescence. I love saying that. Um, that is literally a shared movement experience, a dance class, um, walking with a group. He did research on a group that was rafting together, and what he found is that in these moments, not only are our brains ignited in wonder, but our bodies start to communicate. He talks about the porous nature of our bodies. And so um, your breathing rate, our, breathing rate, our breathing rates regulate, our heart rates begin to sync up, our cortisol levels begin to match one another's, our brain waves begin to begin to match one another when we're experiencing collective effervescence. And I'm sure that's what I experienced in my first dance class. It leads us to feeling part of something bigger than ourselves. So I think, as I said, the rest are sort of self-explanatory. Um, and they are, one more time, moral beauty, collective effervescence, nature, music, visual design. He often talked about architecture in particular there spiritual or religious experiences, stories of life and death, and then epiphanies. And I just want to ask a volunteer um, to maybe share an experience that fits within one of these categories. Does anybody have an experience of awe that you identified that you believe fits in those categories? Yes. Yes. Great. Does anybody have one? So these are not exhaustive, right? These are just the most commonly reported things. Does anybody have one that they don't feel fits the category? I felt like the experience of connecting to my own body was part of my wonder and awe, and it wasn't on the list. But, um, so, it's exciting to me that these things are every day, that you can go out into nature, that you can listen to music, that you can actually intentionally seek out wonder. And what he encourages us to do is that very thing, to seek out your wonder and to then follow it. Um, it is 
the science empowers us to do that, and it shows us that how doing so allows us to live our, our best lives as human beings. We are, um, we are designed or have evolved to live a life full of wonder. And what he says is that people who connect to wonder every day exist in a state of wonder that is characterized as being open to new ideas and to the unknown, being able to sit with uncertainty, seeking out knowledge, and being open to experience itself. So the moral of the science is go out, find your wonder, chase it, chase it, chase it, even if you're crazy, whatever. You got science now to tell people why you're doing it. And really, honestly, the world needs each of us to follow our wonder. So thank you. Thank you.